Tibby, how are you doing? I'm good. I'm doing much better since you kindly got the fan. So uh, <laughs> We should say we're recording on the three days of summer we get in the UK. One yeah, of those yeah. days. We'll keep people guessing <laughs> which one. Um, you've come all the way from a much nicer part of the UK, haven't you? Um, what's it like living in Brighton? Or am I, am I not allowed to say where you live? Because I know some people do feel a bit uneasy about this. No, I'm, I'm cool. That's okay. where, where I actually, yeah, where I live at the moment. Um, Brighton's cool. Uh, it's really sunny at the moment. Lots of tourists. Lots. Of, I went for a run yesterday, nice. and the beach was like oh. just wall to wall full of people. Um, I almost felt like I was intruding, even though I live there. And um, yeah, it's nice that we seem to be having this delayed summer versus what we had in July and August and stuff. So I like it. Although what I'd say is. I haven't really like fully integrated myself into Brighton. I live just like a roll down the hill, well, up the hill from the train station. I sort of use it as a London outpost because it's like an hour into London Bridge, an hour into London Victoria, but Brighton's really nice here. Yeah, yeah I've, I've actually only been to Brighton once. Okay. Um, and it was for a church getaway. Well, we, well, I say getaway, we went, see, I don't know. Folks listening may understand where sometimes your church takes you on like a church trip. On a minibus. This is it. Yeah. And you get, to see, you, you get to see people from your church in a different environment. You're yeah. like, what's going on here? You know, you're seeing uncles walking yeah, barefoot yeah. on the stony beaches. Of yeah, yeah. <laughs> One time my uncle bought a talking drum with him. Um, so we all had a race to see how, how <laughs> who could get furthest away from him because it was ridiculously embarrassing. Anyways, I want to start by even this question of what do I call you? Because mm. um, there is this sort of new... I don't know if it's new, but because you've always had educators, because of social media, you have this new advent of sort of online finance advisors, creators. I mean, I mean what, what is it? How do you think about the work you do? Yeah, it's a great question because the line between advice and guidance or education is actually, it can be quite blurred sometimes. So mm. I actually have like bookmarked on my co computer, the financial <laughs> conduct authorities line on like, <laughs> this is guidance, this is advice. And yeah. generally speaking, guidance focuses on like how stuff works and it's mm. descriptive. And you could in theory access that information online. Like what is a pension? How does a credit card work? That's guidance. And advice is far more prescriptive, far more specific. And it's like, I'm gonna take your bank statements and we're gonna have a look at like, what should you invest in? What mm. type of account should you invest in? And it's got a lot to do with like planning and being tax efficient and stuff. So with the level of following that I have now compared to when I started, I've got combined 30,000 across all my accounts or thereabouts, I couldn't possibly give advice because that would require me to know what is going on specifically with everyone. Mm. So yeah, I just focus on telling people um, stuff that I think they'll find interesting, stuff that I think they'll find useful, but also things that they can actually take action yeah. upon. And I saw this work to a really large extent a few weeks ago in the uh, weekend before Carnival weekend, I posted a clip with me and, and Kia from Pennies to Pounds actually, so from her podcast, and we were talking about junior pensions and junior ices. Got it. The clip's been viewed nearly half a million times. And I think the reason for that is because like for once, it was like a clip about like, here's something you can do for something you really care about, your kids. Mm. Well, what, what's your take though? Because I think <clears throat> even how we titled this episode or people, once they hear like financial educator or create, you know, some people will scoff, some people are suspicious. You know, I feel like for every good, legit, you know, well-read person, there's like seven, sort of, you know, I don't know shade to B-Tech, but yeah. I suppose <laughs> B-Tech versions. So like, what's your take on the industry and the ease at which people can pick up a mic and say, you know, buy instead of renting or yeah, do this yeah. instead of doing this? I think in general, because uh, I know a lot of people in the space, in general, a lot of people are genuinely trying to help. Mm. So 
I would say that most of the people you see around today, and this is just based off my experience, started their platforms in the pandemic, like mm. around about uh, March, oh, April, yes. 2020, back when uh, like it was lockdown. And around that time, there were a lot of people that had a lot of spare time on their hands, but there was also a shift in terms of people's finances. Like a lot yeah. of people either had a financial difficulty, they'd lost their job, and they were thinking about money a lot more or they were furloughed and they had loads of surplus cash and they were thinking about what they should be doing with all this extra money. Did you, did you start in lockdown? I started beforehand and okay. I, was, I wasn't really on socials. I started a monthly meetup. Really? Yeah. Old school. Did yeah. we have to knock it and say Roscoe to come in? <laughs> <laughs> well, there was no security on the door. We actually had someone come in off the street. That was a bit scary considering it was, it was in Brixton. But um, Yeah, you want to check that. Yeah, but like <laughs> generally people, people are, they want to help. There are people from lots of different walks of life. Uh, walks of life. You've got um, like parents. Yeah. You've got actual qualified uh, financial advisors. You've got insurance people. You've got students. Um, you've got the property people. I consider myself to be a bit more of a generalist. So I'll speak to most issues, um, and that's partially because I'm a bit of a magpie, and partially because I'm like interested in like lots of different things. Maybe those are both the same thing, actually. Yeah. But. Um, we're actually strongly disincentivized from trying to mislead people because it's your face that's on your platform. And if you mislead people, if you try and sell something dodgy, you're eventually going to be found out like the internet will come for you. So for people who are online and they're seeing you know, someone talk about property, finance, investing, whatever the case may be, I think there's a few things to look out for. I think one, definitely look for people who are qualified in their field. And like our friend Bola Souls just said today that she's a qualified financial advisor. I actually think qualifications are important because yeah. if I was getting medical advice from like an online doctor type personality, I would probably trust what they're saying more if they'd studied and they'd done it. For sure. But for those who aren't qualified, there are people who are like affiliated with charities they're on the boards of companies yeah, yeah. They're, they're like affiliated with other reputable organizations and then there are people who just have tenure they've just been around for a long time and when you've been around for a long time and you're still trusted that's kind of the social proof and the social backing and stuff so i would say the industry is largely good but of course with any industry you're gonna have your share of bad actors this is it and i love the kind of checking qualifications because you know you could have someone who's a doctor of zoology right but like you're like, but they're a doctor. And you're like, uh, well, yeah. <laughs> of zoology. Yeah. Um, and 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 on that point, like I'm I'm training to become a financial advisor as well. Like I'm one, I'm one exam away from qualifying. Yeah. So yeah. well, if we backtrack a bit, because I'm actually quite interested in that. So before, obviously, now you're you're training, but even before that, sort of, how did you get into this? Have you always, you know, speaking to Kia, who who you know, I guess suppose is a mutual of ours. You spoke. She spoke about how you know <laughs> what was the story. It was quite funny. She said, I think she said from like primary school, she had like people working for her. She was selling all these sweets on them. Were you always that kind of person or? Um, I did actually set up a couple businesses in secondary school and I had a business throughout uni as well. So in secondary school, I used to make music on Fruity Loops really? and I used to, <laughs> used to burn it to CD and, and sell it to people. And I also started a graphic design business, which I, I carried on through to um, uni as well. What but happened to Fruity Loops or Fruit? Was it Fruit Loops or Fruity? Fru Fru Fruity Loops. Oh gosh, what happened to it? I don't know. I hope they're still around. No one paid for it. So yeah, it's, yeah, it's I guess to, maybe that's what happened. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, w I was an entrepreneurial type, but I would say um, I, I have kind of industry yeah. experience. So my first job outside of uh, after uni was at a financial PR company. And I was a researcher at banking clients, insurance clients, investment clients, and there'll be words like discre discretionary fund manager and balance transfer credit card thrown around. And I just wanted to be good at my job. I just wanted to understand yeah. how all that stuff worked. And as a young person, I also had a lot of question about money as well. So um, I looked into it and had a really big personal development push around that time. I see. So you've always sort of been a learner, a student of, of this sort of industry. And so it kind of, once you read so what got you to that space where you're like okay cool, let's start creating then when i started seeing and reading the same things over and over again i thought okay now it's time to share now it's time to put something out there and i had a hunch when i started in 2019 that if if i started sharing stuff because a lot of it was us-based at mm -hmm. the time so i started sharing stuff for a uk audience it would 
it will take off because you had lots of US, you know, if you ask most people, like, what's your favorite, what's your favorite finance book? Or what, or what was like the first book <laughs> that kind of got you into it? At Excel, like maths, like by Really? <laughs> okay. For a lot of people, it's Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, I oh you mean finance book as in so I thought you meant so Ed Excel was the was the school book was, was the school yeah kind of, the exam board yeah, yeah. yeah which I actually I love maths so I used to I used to fall asleep reading that when I was young because okay. we, we weren't allowed to play games anyways um, in terms of book hey there just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast uh, we have a great desire to grow this podcast and one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening uh, follow or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get, but also the better the podcast gets. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. Hmm. I don't, so here's the, I've actually never read Rich Dad Pro Dad. Should I read, should I read it? Because there's all these guys online that say, once you read Rich Dad Poor Dad, your eyes will open. I, I kind of know the summary, but. Yeah, I think Rich Dad Poor Dad is a fantastic gateway book. <laughs> so. Got you. My brother's a teenager and I'm like, you need to read this book. Cause I think for the first, if it's one of the first books you read, it kind of opens your eyes up to, okay, there's income and there's expenses, but there's also assets and liabilities. So you can trade your money in for like consumables, but you can yeah. also trade your money for things which will go up in value over time. And that was my first lesson into that. For whatever reason, I read that book, The Penny Dropped, and uh, that kind of stayed with me. But I would say that if you are part of the way on your financial literacy journey, then maybe um, maybe you don't need to read it. Maybe you already know the core messages that are in the yeah. book. Yeah, but I do, I mean, I don't know. I think the thought of reading the finance book just sounds really dry to me. <laughs> um, <but laughs> no no uh, offense, but maybe uh, maybe it's maybe I need to be the right one but i do like fiction yeah i've been sort of getting back into fiction okay originally. so it's like you're you're a fiction rather than a non-fiction person yeah well for a long time i was a non-fiction guy okay now i'm a fiction guy All i right. read a john grisham classic well one of his new books and it was again a, gate, a sort of a gateway drug book for me because now i'm like knee deep in fiction again and something's different about reading a story that allows your mind to travel. No, I, I think it's immensely powerful and I'd love to to join you on that because <laughs> I've, I've been straight nonfiction for well over half a decade now. No way. And on the point about finance books, I know at this point, many finance authors, there are loads of great books out there. Yeah. Um, the kind of the, the newer... The, the books have been written in the last five years, a lot of really good ones because of this explosion um, yeah. in, in the industry. But stories are really good as well. The last fiction book I read was The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime. I know that book. And, and it's fantastic. Yeah, and I just, I finished it so quickly. quickly it was yeah. amazing. It's not, um, yeah, it's, it's, I, I know that. And I haven't made it into something, a, a, a play A theater show, yeah. 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 So that, that was amazing. And that, yeah, that feeling you get from reading a story is very, very different I to reading a fiction book. I think you would love John Grisham. I, the, I am somewhat of an evangelist. Is he, of, is he the street lawyer? No. So, well, hold on. That might be one of his books. He yeah, has written yeah. like 42. Yeah. But he, he, he's um, written like 40 bestsellers, which is just ridiculous, right? Um, but he does sort of cry, a lot of crime, mm -hmm. courtroom dramas, you know, and he has a way of using, like there's a book called The Boys from Biloxi, which I recently read. And there's a chapter where he's narrating a boxing match. And I know this sounds so over the top, but I felt like I was there. Like I felt yeah, like a, that's good it's, writing. A, it's a boxing match, yeah. you know, which is just people punching each other. Yeah. But, but his use of words, of similes, of how he sort of arranges the sentences, you feel like you're sat courtside, literally watch it and you've put some money down and the, and the result really matters. And it's like, wow, someone's able to use this, use words if you like to do this. I think that where the magic really happens. So that, that sounds really good. And yeah. I know completely where you're coming from. I think that the magic happens with books when people are able to marry the two. Mm -hmm. And that's what The Curious Incident did for me. Because it was fundamentally a book about maths and science mm -hmm. and about this you know, young autistic boy's experience. But then it was part of his like, life story and this kind of murder mystery as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the best writers are able to use storytelling and fiction to actually teach you something. There's one more book which I think maybe links to an experience you were speaking about, <clears throat> which I started reading and I struggled. Um, 
but I bring it up, which is um, talking to strangers, Malcolm Gladwell. Mm. Um, I like Malcolm Gladwell in general, mm-hmm. yeah, except good. for a debate he had um, with, with, I forgot who it was. It, it was a debate about the mainstream media and whether new media was like the new frontier. And he, and he was a really bad in that debate. Away from that was random- it, Was he arguing against new he was media? Ar- he was arguing, yeah, against. So he was arguing for kind of traditional. Oh, right. But the way he, but he, it was more how he argued it. It was kind okay. of really patronizing and all these sort of things. But and he was arguing against Douglas Murray and you never want to be patronizing to Douglas Murray. But anyways, that's an interesting thing that people can check out if they're interested. But in talking to strangers, it starts with the um, Sandra Bland incident. And what he does is he basically uses that as a sort of, you know, story to speak about what happens when two strangers come together and because of their preconceptions of each other, they're sort of, you know, it, it, it's like it, it, it was bound to get bad <laughs> <laughs> in that you had a, a black woman who he writes was a distrustful of the police. You had a police officer who was distrustful of black people mm. and both of them had such sort of, you know, negative conceptions of each other that that interaction could have been a routine stop, but it wasn't. I thought I disagreed with his characterization of it, but I did understand the general point of sort of how what we think about people colors, the, you know, the, the kind of our first interaction, as it were. Now you had interaction with the police as well. What a segue, right? Look at yeah, that. Yeah, <laughs> I did. Um, I did a couple couple years ago in lockdown in 2021. Um, on the first nice day of the year, it was a February. So you you come through, basically from October, the yeah. clocks, it, spring forward, fall back, the clocks go back, then it's just dark. So we had the day of sun in February and I was cycling around and um, I was, you know, you know when you're kind of, you're riding a bike and you see a police, or you're just walking along and you see a police car and you go, oh, a police car. <laughs> I That's what I thought when I saw it. And then, the police were kind of standing outside it and then they waved over to me. And in a split second, I realized that the police car was there for me. Oh, wow. And they're like, yeah, can you, you know, come over, um, come, uh, we just want to like speak to you. <clears throat> Maybe put my bike to the side. They asked me to get off it. And then it was just, it was just very smooth how I went from being civilian to someone who was about to be searched. And they're like, yeah, we've just, we've seen you. We've seen that your movements in the area are like really suspicious. And we're just going to detain you for a search under pace. And this was 2021. So George Floyd had already been murdered. We'd already had this kind of reignition of the conversation around race in the UK and the US. Yeah. And, um, to be fair, so there's three police officers. One of them kind of stood on the side. Maybe he's the one who makes sure you don't run away. Then one of them did the actual kind of take off your clothes, empty your pockets kind of thing. And then there was a third one who just from the beginning didn't like me. The one who actually spoke to me was nice. He was nice the whole way through. So he asked me to empty out my pockets. The one who didn't like me went through my wallet. He pulled all of my individual cards on my wallet. He said to make sure that it wasn't stolen. And then they asked me why I was out. I said I was out getting my government sponsored exercise. Um, <laughs> the but, one a day. Yeah, yeah, the, the whatever. <laughs> um, and they, they didn't believe it. So they wrote a sh- on a piece of paper, couldn't account for why he was out and uh, gave it to me and then sent me on my way. And I understood when I was called over why in like not just in the UK but particularly in countries like the States why people like don't always comply and why people run away because you think like this could be like they could try to kill me or hurt this me is it. This and, the, and their recollection of it is always going to be yeah so this is, is this be three three people and, and just you so I posted about it at the time was like my most um viewed post um but do you know what like I like to have a balanced perspective on things I think Broadly speaking, the police actually do a fantastic job in, in, in this country and in London in particular, particularly when it comes to the policing of large scale events like the Olympics, like Carnival, like we had the other week. I actually went up to a police officer and I was like, do you know what? I think you lot do a fantastic job. I have no idea how you're policing this. Um, but when it comes to the kind of like we see you, we think that you might be committing a crime. Um, <clears throat> we're going to stop you. That's where it kind of breaks down. Mm. I think that there is discrimination. I just refuse to believe that if I was like a blonde woman on a bike or like a Chinese guy on a bike, they would have stopped me. Um, but I also think they don't have the right tools. 
think about it. How do you tell that someone's got something on them? You have to ask them to take their clothes off or take things out of their pocket. If a firefighter is called to a fire, they at least have a truck and a hose. Mm. Like they don't go with a bucket of water or something. I'm like, why can't the police have like a scanner or like whatever the case may be? So I think like it's like lack of tools plus discrimination plus just already fraught experience, which leads to experiences like mine or like in the book that you mentioned. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Wow, that's a trip down memory lane for you. But I imagine it's, it's always, you remember those moments though. Don't for, you? for the rest like, of my life. Yeah. yeah. I, told, I told them like, this is just going to stay with me for the rest of my life. This may be one search for you. Yeah. But this is like a pivotal kind of mo- moment. For I mean, me. I've thought often about stop and search in general because, you know, I mean, I remember seeing the new commissioner on, I think it was BBC One Extra, um, talking about sort of how many knives are basically confiscated on a weekly basis which you know and guns and which is amazing the fact that they actually removed us off the streets and the only way they get that is stop and search but what is important and what they need to report on and remember are the knives not seized and the drugs not confiscated for every knife you're seizing and that's off the streets which is great uh, they, I think they quoted their statistics to me as well. Yeah. It's like you have another four or five searches where you're patting someone down, um, scaring them, humiliating them, whatever the case may yeah. be, and then sending them on, on their way. And each time you have an interaction like that, you're actually fracturing the relationship between the police and the community um, a lot more. So, so, so w- w- kindness, you, kindness yeah. goes a long way. Understanding transparency all these things go a long way yeah i mean obviously you know we're not experts in this area so you know i don't want to give too much of a soapbox speech but i do wonder though in its place or if because again if i'm hearing you right or you're saying we shouldn't have stuff and such at all or you or you think it just needs to be sort of done differently i mean you said a guy was nice you know if they were all nice would they have changed their experience or or is it just a humiliating thing irrespective of how it's done i think that stop and search um, is a tool in their arsenal and um, it can be it can be useful right they are actually confiscating stuff and I, I gave some thought to this uh, as well like we're actually accustomed to being searched right if you go to the airport yeah you're searched if you go to the supermarket and you're to buy alcohol they will ask you what your age is or ask to see ID I think the reason why we don't react with alarm to these things in general is because there's an actual like rule book with, with the alcohol example there'll be a sign there saying if you look under this age then we may ask you in the airport it's like everyone's being searched and it's flattering when they ask you yeah and you're like <laughs> you're thank like, you thanks mate I'll keep keep moisturizing <laughs> but um but when it comes to stop and search i think from the get-go you're kind of like yeah but you're just picking on me yeah so i think it's the implementation and like they just didn't do the things they were supposed to do like mm. they asked me for my name i said i didn't want to give it to them but then they went through my wallet and i read the rules afterwards and i didn't have to do that and they were supposed to tell me either their police numbers or their names beforehand it just wasn't implemented properly mm. so be be fair be transparent use it sparingly and let the person feel like you're performing a service for them. You are searching them to make the streets safer for them. You're not treating them like a criminal, yeah. unduly. That's a small nuance, but very, very important distinction, I think. Um, okay, let, let's zoom out, I suppose, and think about, because I'm interested. So how, how has created online, like how has that changed your life? In what way you know, uh, uh, has, have things changed for you? It's changed my life a lot. Um, I would say that, so I've been doing this for four years, Um, got started in 2019, and I would say overall, this has been a journey of coming out of my shell. Because even though I have a background as a researcher, and I've always had this private interest in money, um, everything that you see me doing, that isn't me on a spreadsheet or making graphics somewhere, is stuff that I've had to learn in that four year Mm. time and actually t- time span and actually the first time i tried a lot of things for the first time like the first ever podcast episode i did the first time i recorded myself on camera the first time i spoke on stage i wasn't actually very good and i was kind of sweating the entire time but you do stuff i was, I was speaking to someone about confidence yesterday a friend of mine um and she was saying that she wouldn't start creating online, but she didn't feel confident yet. And I go mm. to her, well, what's confidence? And she goes, oh, like um, taking action. 
you know, feeling like you can do something. I was like, well, the reason why, for example, when you cross the street, you cross without feeling nervous is because you've done it hundreds, maybe even thousands of times before. Confidence is knowledge that you will achieve a certain, like a given outcome. So you actually need to take action first and then the confidence will come. It doesn't happen the other way around. So this journey I've been on is just about doing stuff that's slightly outside of my comfort zone in a low stakes scenario if I can. A podcast is a great example of that because if I mess up here, then we just pause the cameras or we just cut it out for the final <laughs> edit, hopefully. Um, what are you talking about? We're putting the, <laughs> yeah, we'll put the whole thing online. The whole thing <laughs> been recording since I, since I got here. Um, yes, yeah, so you do start, you take, you do stuff that's growthful, that pushes you outside of your comfort zone, a little bit outside of it, and you do it in low stakes environments. And then three, four, five years later, you're going to come across as confident. But like, it's just because you've done the thing so many times. Yeah. I think I'm a great speaker now, but I've done loads of talks. My yeah. first talk wasn't uh, Malcolm X speech, neither was it Steve <laughs> Jobs speech, but um, I've done a lot. You get similar questions and stuff, and then you just build up a memory bank in your head of like, yeah, I can do this. Yeah. I mean, that's really interesting. Now, I've, I've, I've um, riffed a lot on confidence too. And I think one thing you said there, that's so key is, and I think this is something actually a lot of, um, a lot of, uh, what do you call it? Motivational speakers get wrong mm -hmm. in that they, they link motivation to this sort of internal thing where you have to believe something. So you're working hard to, to conjure up something inside of you that quite frankly doesn't exist. And I think most people know that when they're faking it, they know they're faking it. And so it doesn't feel real, but when you tether your confidence to experience you, experiences you've had, things you've done, then it's like you're showing your body the calluses. Sorry, you're showing your mind the calluses on your hands, right? When it says you can't do something, you kind of go, look at my hands. Like I've literally done it a hundred times. And so, you know, and, and there may be calluses in your mind as well, but ultimately it's tethered to, to some demonstrable kind of truth rather than this ethereal sense of, yeah, I just need to believe in myself. It's like, no, you need to create a habit of doing things, of stretching yourself or stepping out your comfort zone. Yeah. And you just become more confident. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I wrote about this in the newsletter that I write weekly, um, this confidence thing. So, so would you... <laughs> Would you look at yourself now and say you're far more confident than you used to be? Or is it still a sort of like a... Hmm. The confidence piece, um, <coughs> the whole feeling of faking it until you make it, uh, I don't think that ever fully goes away. Mm. Um, because if you consistently seek experiences that are outside of your comfort zone, then actually you will always feel as if you're doing something that's growthful. And that's that's the position that I want to put myself in. I think if I ever do something and I'm not a little bit nervous or I'm not a little bit like, ah, oh, this is kind of painful in some way, not bad pain, but like the pain you get when you go to the gym perhaps, um, then uh, I perhaps aren't, uh, I'm perhaps not pushing myself hmm. um, let me Let me put you on the spot then. So before the year's over, what's one thing you want to do that you're a bit like, oh, I'm not sure I could do this, but I want to do it. Before the year is over? Yeah. Mm. I think something that I've not done yet is it would be good to just give a talk on stage without slides. So like whenever I speak, it's kind of, it's the information that's speaking, it's not me. Mm. I always have either like here's something you can invest in or here's an account and stuff. And like, if you say the right things, people will listen and they'll write things down. But it'll be interesting for me to just talk on a stage in front of people, not on a panel, but like just to me, like, like a TED talk, basically. Yeah. yeah. Okay. If I, if I could do something like a TED talk by the end of the year, then that would be, um, that would be appropriately growthful for me, I think. And you've put it out there. So, uh, and the, and the things, happen, the, <laughs> yeah, the things that you put out there happen. People say that you shouldn't talk about your goals. I completely disagree with that. Mm. For me, if I tweet something that I want to do as a goal, or if I make a LinkedIn post about a goal I have, just given the amount of people I know now, someone will, will reach out and be like, oh, I saw your post. Yeah. Are you interested in doing a thing? So I'm a big believer in putting stuff out there as long as you take action afterwards. This is it. I mean, if you only talk about your goals, that is most definitely 
um, not oh, helpful. Way to not I used to have a friend, um, a flatmate. We used to get along like a house on fire, and we used to talk about what we wanted to do all day long. And it's odd. There's something odd about talking about what you want to do frequently because you feel like you've done it. Mm. <laughs> you haven't even done. So we're like, I want to start this. I want to do this. Yeah. And it would be like, but well, we haven't done any of it. Yeah. So we, we set a rule. We're like, we're not allowed to talk about anything we're going to do to each other ever again. Mm-hmm. Um, all we can do in this house is come and share what we've done with yeah, each other. Yeah, That's yeah. it. Well, maybe, maybe, yeah, maybe talking about the goal is only half the conversation. Share goals with someone that you know is going to hold you accountable, <coughs> but then come back and talk about what you've actually done. Check in as well, yeah. And that 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 just helps you keep moving forward, as it were. Um, I suppose people are probably thinking, at what stage are they going to talk about finance? <laughs> <laughs> so, at risk of um of of uh, offending maybe some of your your viewers and followers who may have clicked on this to hear you talk about things, um, we asked ChatGPT to ask you some questions about finance. Um. <laughs> okay, this is, I've never done this before. <laughs> I feel like, wow, this feels so pop, but it makes me feel sick. I have this iconoclastic thing of yeah. not wanting to be pop. And yeah. this feels like, we asked ChatGPT five <laughs> questions for a financial educator. I've never done this before. And this is what we've done. I, so was it, say, I was actually thinking the other day about how you can use ChatGPT to improve your finances. I want okay. to do. I want to do a video on it. So maybe this will inspire me. Well, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so I mean, t- to be fair, it, it, these are things I would have probably said mm. because they're general things that, as an educator, I, I imagine are your bread and butter. First mm. and foremost, being budgeting. Right. So the first question was about around budgeting. You know, what are some effective strategies for budgeting? Mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, I'll add more color to it in the. I want you to speak to this specifically within the context of cost of living and the fact that, you know, for a lot of people, they have very little headroom in their sort of budget and what they can afford. So when it comes to like saving and you know, some of that just doesn't exist for certain people because right now it's just, I, I just make enough to get by. So how would you advise that sort of person around budgeting? Someone mm-hmm. who's really stressed and really sort of pressed. Should they be budgeting? Should they just be going with the flow? Hey there, just want to say thank you for listening or for watching uh, this podcast. Uh, we have a great desire to grow this podcast. And one of the ways we're going to do that is if you listening, uh, follow, or if you are watching, you subscribe to the podcast. The faster it grows, um, the more guests we can get, but also the better the podcast gets. So please just do me a favor, hit the subscribe button or the follow button. Um, back to the episode. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I'll just take the word should out of it, right? You you don't have to budget. It's not immoral not to. But if you, like you've heard of the saying, what gets measured gets managed. If you try to go about your day, never checking your calendar or never checking a clock, and you're trying to catch trains and (laughs) meet up with people for dinner and stuff, maybe you'd turn up on time, maybe you wouldn't. But if you checked your clock, if you checked your calendar, you would probably increase the likelihood of doing so. So setting a budget is exactly the same thing. It's just having a an idea of what's going out and what's coming in, both backward looking and forward looking. So the first thing I'll say to people is, when it comes to budgeting, try to create systems that require, you set it up once and then it just works for uh, like for the foreseeable future. So when it comes to saving, Try and save on or or just after the day you get paid and try and automate that. So set up a, a standing order and try and save into a separate bank account from the one that you get paid into. Why? Because if you have all your money sitting in one bank account, then you're way more likely to dip in. Not because you're a bad person, but just because it's all there. Parkinson's law, right? Like a task will expand to fill up the time that's allocated to it and you will spend money that's there. That's just the way that we are. So you automate your savings, you do it to a separate bank account. We live in an age where you have automatic payments coming out, direct debits, bills, subscriptions, and what have you. So a system that I've created, and I know that lots of other people do, is you sync all of your bills to come out by a certain day each month. Because if, you, if they're just coming out on the day that you signed up for them, that means that on the 12th, you've got the gas coming out, and on the 27th, you've got three mobile taking stuff out, and then on the 13th, you have PlayStation taking stuff out. Try and sync them all for, the, for a day in the month, bill day. Why? Because once the last bill has come out, 
all of the rest of the money in your bank account is only going to be spent if you choose to spend it. And you can resync your direct debits either by calling up the providers or going on the website of the providers and change the direct debit date. And for your subscriptions, your video streaming, your um, music streaming, you simply unsubscribe on the day and then resubscribe on the day that you would like to be billed for. That's a lot of people. That's like game changing information for a lot of people. Yeah. And it, you won't be able to do it all at once, but after like two, uh, one, one or two months, you'll, you'll have resynced everything. And you just know, like bill day, you'll just look at your um, bank account. You'll just be like, okay, rent, gas, electricity, uh, subscriptions. And then the, the rest of your money just sits there. And then it's for you to decide how you want to use it. Um, and I'd also say spend from a different bank account to the one that you get paid into another system. You get paid into a bank account. You, um, you have bill day, all your bills come out on the same day. Terrible you day. then, <laughs> you then set, you then sent your savings are gone out automatically also on bill day to a separate bank account. And by the way, save as much or as little as you can, even if it's a pound from my perspective, because it, saving something is better than nothing. And then build up to, um, what, uh, a, a savings, uh, target. But then like another bill, transfer a set amount of pocket money, spending money to a separate bank account so that you can spend from that. Um, and if you can do it from one of the, the banks that kind of does your, tracks your spending for you even better. Um, and this means that you have a set amount of money that you're using for your day-to-day -day expenses. So not, not for your bills, that's already, like your core expenses already accounted for in your main bank account, but in your second bank account, that's what you're gonna use for buying clothes. That's what you're gonna use uh, for eating out for experiences and that sort of thing. And as you check it, you will just adjust as the month goes on and you'll have a sense of how much you, you should be um, spending or not. Then the final thing I'll say is, and particularly as prices have been ri uh, rising over the last um, year and a half, two years, is check in with your finances weekly as opposed to monthly. I have no idea what I spent money on this day 30 days ago because it was last month. But I do know what I spent money on last week. The day that I check my finances on a Sunday, I will look at all my spend, go, how did the last seven days go? If there's too many cabs, there's too many Nandos in there, that's absolutely fine. Make a plan for the next seven days about how you'd like your spend to go. No seven day period is gonna be exactly the same, particularly if you don't have a bill day. Yeah. But again, you're just getting into this non-judgmental habit, breaking things down to the, uh, the simplest they can be and creating systems. And you can use a free budgeting app to do this open banking, link all your bank accounts, tag all your transactions, that's, that's budgeting. And actually I've sat down in budgeting sessions with people who didn't want to look at their bank accounts were in a lot of debt, <coughs> um, were feeling like ashamed and guilty about their expenses. Once you show them these systems, you kind of remove the onus from yeah. them. And there's this terrific sense of like momentum. They're like, wow, this is like poetry almost. They're like, <laughs> all the numbers add up and like everything's yeah. categorized and, oh, I was signed up to that. I didn't realize I'm gonna cancel it and stuff. That is budgeting. And once you do it, it'll be like brushing your teeth. You'll be like, how did I not do this? Yeah, I mean, I, mean that, I, think, I mean, that's so, just so brilliant, uh, you know, that you've got people behind the camera all, uh, all looking at you. Uh, <laughs> that's, that's, that's always my check for when the guests are saying something important. When people, when people behind the camera are like that, <laughs> like, you know, people hear podcasters come here and go all the time. Um, but, but let's pick up on that point because I, I think it would be good to help somebody who's listening who is in debt. Yeah. And so when you're in debt, yeah. you know what you're going to find when you open your account. Mm. Hence why you don't really want to look at it, right? So when the, people like budget, you're like, I don't want to see that. Yeah. <laughs> it's going to cause me too much stress. Yeah. But, what, but obviously, if they don't look at it, it doesn't get better. Yeah, yeah. So how would you advise that person that's, that has so much negative emotion around their bank account? Language is very, very important. So you just said, I'm in debt which is like being in prison. <laughs> the reality is that you have debt and the debt isn't a part of you. It's not, um, doesn't not reflect on your character or your capabilities as a person. Um, we don't learn about uh, finances. Uh, there's no standardized financial education in this which country. Which is wild, by the way. Yeah, and I, I could talk about that for another hour. Um, <laughs> you find out 
when you do learn, you learn way too late. So I learned about overdrafts when I took out an overdraft to go to um, university. And so if you're someone who's ended up in debt, you're far more, in, rather than being someone who is not capable or not competent, you're far more in the position of someone who's just lacking knowledge. You're like someone who's been handed the keys to a car and been told to drive the M25 without taking a single driving lesson. Well, of course, a percentage of those cars are going to crash. Mm -hmm. So that's why people like me exist, to teach people how this stuff works. So if you have debt, then it's very, very simple. If you have a credit score or credit rating that enables you to do so, you consolidate that debt. If you have high interest credit card debt, you can take out what's called a balance transfer credit card, which you apply for. You can transfer debt from a high interest environment to a low interest environment. Forget, forget about the high interest cards. This balance transfer credit card is going to have a 0% period for a period of sometimes as long as 24 months. And as long as you pay the minimums every month, then you don't pay any more interest. So that's just a bunch of debts made into one debt and it's at 0% interest for however many months. And you just have to be mindful that you pay it off in its entirety by the time the 0% interest period ends, because then it pings back up to the normal, normal APR. If you have an expensive overdraft, we know that the average interest rate on a credit card is 20%. On an overdraft, it's double that. It's about 39%. You can consolidate an overdraft or overdrafts into what's called a money transfer credit card, which is where you withdraw money from the credit card. Again, pay off the expensive overdraft, and then you pay off the money transfer credit card again at a 0% rate. So you can do that. If you don't have the um, credit rating to do that that's absolutely fine you just use one of two methods snowball or avalanche method which is they both have the same beginning uh, point which is get all your debts and write them down and if you can't do this alone because it's painful then try and do it with someone that you trust or um yeah, someone who you know is not going to judge you someone that you feel safe with i've sat down with people and i've written out their debts with them each individual debt, the APRs for each of them, the minimum payments for each of them, and when they need to be paid off by in a spreadsheet. If you choose to do it by the snowball method, you arrange the debts from the lowest balance to the highest balance first. And with each month, you pay as much as you can off the lowest balance. So if you say I have 50 pounds on a credit card, you clear that and you just pay the minimums on the rest and do that with the, with the smallest balance, then the next smallest, the next smallest, so it's all paid off. If you want to do it mathematically, yeah, like cheaply, then you do it from the lowest APR first. Oh, sorry, from the highest APR first, so the most expensive debt. You throw everything you can at that every month, the minimums on the rest, most expensive, then next most expensive, then next most expensive. And you just realize that like what you're doing is... It's not something that's going to change overnight and it probably won't change in a few weeks. But after a year, two years of steadily, methodically paying off your debt, um, then you won't have it anymore. And that will put you in a better position than, you know, many, many people, you know, just simply just writing it down and, and knowing what debt you have. So good. I mean, I have nothing to add other than I hope people find the strength to confront it, as you said, because things do get better, can get better. Um, and I suppose... Yeah, it's what keeps a lot of young people in that sort of cycle, right? Where they just don't think they can ever be free from debt. I mean, and even the way I'll, and we can talk about the government, because even the way we think about debt, so take going to university, for instance, you take a loan, a loan that most people don't pay back. And so people get sort of comfortable with this idea of just having this debt that, again, it seems as though the government doesn't really think they'll pay it back. They don't think they'll pay it back. Mm -hmm. So I've heard all sorts of, sto sort of stories, people saying that they, they go and check their student loan every few weeks to just to see how much is risen by and be like, oh, it's yeah. cute. And then they just go away. And you kind of go, what? This seems yeah. really well, bad. The, well, the, the student loan isn't um, a consumer debt in the traditional sense, in mm. the sense that it doesn't appear on your credit file and it uh, is wiped you know, at the moment after 30 years, but that's going up. Um, it's more, it functions like a tax, right? You go to uni, it's graduate you, tax yeah, really, you it? have this nominal amount that you have to pay back. Mm -hmm. You start paying the April after you leave uni and you pay a percentage of an amount that you earn over a threshold for a given period of time. And the stats say that if you earn 50 grand or more a year, then there's a 50, 50, a 50, if you earn 50 grand starting salary after leaving uni, then there's a 50, 50 chance that you'll pay your debt off. So actually higher earners are most in a position to pay their debt off. But if you earn below this 50 
grand threshold, then you need to look at what your other financial priorities are. The money that you're throwing at your student loan, you could actually be using to save up a house deposit, you could be using it to pay into a pension, you could be using it to just live off you know, cash for today. So I think when it comes to going to university, because there is this wider question around whether you should go to uni or not, I think it's more important to think about whether you're going to uni for the right reasons and whether it's good for you. There are other routes into work mm. um, other than the academic route. What about if you have the debt already or, you know, the kind of student loan? Yeah. Um, again, a lot of people just, it's just there. You know, do we need to change attitudes around that? If you, ha if you have the debt already, then, um, or, or the student loan already, I, I check mine every month. I'll log into the gov.uk website and check the balance. But again, it's like, it's debt that I have. Like, I am not in debt. Mm. No, it's not a reflection on my personal character. And it's just something that I'm aware of. What is important, and if you, particularly if you wanted to do something like buy a house, is how your repayments affect your disposable income. Because if you have a big chunk of your disposable income coming in the form of um, student loan repayments, then that will affect your affordability and therefore like your um, favorability in the eyes of lenders. That's important, but the big number is, is less so. Yeah, and it will go down if you pay it gently yeah. <laughs> um okay so let's just slag off the government really quickly before, <laughs> we, before we finish so why is the government not why is financial education like i, do, I mean i feel something about political education right yeah <clears throat> why isn't it part of the curriculum it is part of the curriculum oh, i really? believe it's been part of the curriculum for about nine or ten years now um around 2014 um but uh, don't don't quote me on that. So this is like and a, it's just like, is this a sort of PSHE add-on? That's it. It's, or, it's, it's on the curriculum. I know it's on the curriculum because Martin Lewis funded a textbook with the charity Young Enterprise. He put in 250,000 of his own money to create a textbook. But it's very difficult for teachers to teach it because they have lots of other core subjects to teach and they may not necessarily feel knowledgeable enough to teach it or have the bandwidth or the time. Mm. We have what's called a financial education problem in this country and the problem is threefold. One, there is no standardized financial education in the UK and like in other similar economies like the US. Banks do some of the financial education but their, their focus I think should primarily be on building products and also they, they're kind of incentivized to sell these products to you. So bank A isn't going to recommend bank B's bank account, even if bank B's bank account is better. That's one. Um, we do get some financial education from our parents, but it's whatever your family history is, that's what you get. The school's point we've addressed, schools do teach it. I know this because I've volunteered in a school to teach it, but it's very much time and bandwidth dependent. But does every school teach it or is it dependent on schools that, as you said, where's the they space have to have the, the time. curriculum? Yeah. Really care. Yeah. They have to have the time and the bandwidth. Um, but it certainly does happen. Although my youngest brother, who's going into his A-levels now, says that he didn't receive much financial education at school. So I was like, gosh, this is something that needs to change. And then of course, financial education is picked up by content creators like myself and educators. But um, we, I think, a lot of us are slaves to uh, the algorithm. Like you could be shouting the most useful thing into the void, but it might not reach anyone. Um, so that's the first problem. No standardized financial education. Second problem is the fact that we learn about money way too late. We're getting to the root cause here. We learn about money way too late. At what age do you think our adult financial habits are set? 25? Try seven. <laughs> really? Cambridge study 10 years ago showed that our adult financial habits are set at age seven, which means that you need to start learning about money much, much earlier than that. And we also know from the research and the science that children as young as three years old are able to recognize different coins by their shape and color and stuff. So really, it's something that you want to start talking to even like a toddler about, about money. But this is made even more difficult from the fact that we're living in a more, uh, an increasingly cashless society. And good, like, I can't remember the last time I held a coin or like used a coin, for, any <laughs> used a coin for anything. Um, so... We need to learn about money way, way earlier. And we need to remember that phys the physicality of money is still important, mm. even though cashlessness is convenient. Um, and then the final issue is that, yes, you can learn about money at this point in time. So I went to secondary school in the uh, early noughties, 
But they couldn't have taught me about buy now, pay later or like online shopping to the extent that mm. it is today. So it's like, you need to learn about money early, but then you need to have follow up. You almost need to have like, it's like you install the software, but then you need to have these like patch updates throughout your life. It makes no sense teaching a three-year-old about pensions. It makes mm. no sense teaching someone um, in primary school about inheritance tax. So you need someone um, with you the whole way. So I don't want to put it mainly <coughs> on government incompetence, I think it's actually a really thorny and difficult problem, which would be solved by having a standardized form of financial education that's accessible to everyone and meets them at their life stage and at their financial milestones. And that's what I'm building. That's what Mr. Money Charles is about. Please carry on. Uh, I, uh, you have a new follow I was following you already. <laughs> you have a new follow I'm sure many people listening to this have been helped by this. And even though we only spent a bit of time riffing about it as well, I mean, I think we've got a at some stage uh, spend like a full hour talking about some of these issues um, but this was really great I really enjoyed talking to you oh. this, was, this, was, this was really yeah I, I like the direction it took yeah. thank you for having me <laughs> no, thank you for being on thank you for being on